The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented transcribed as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Midway in tonight's program, in place of the usual commercial we will bring you a special message on inflation from Thomas I. Parkinson, president of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Tonight, the subject of our FBI file, hijacking. Its title, Captain Larceny. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI brings out a significant fact. Despite the introduction of hundreds of scientific aids, of improved detection equipment, and of faster communication, the most important factor in crime investigation is still brain power. There is no substitute for human intelligence. That is why the qualifications for a special agent of the Federal Bureau of Investigation have been made exceedingly exacting. Only picked men those who measure up to the highest mental, physical, and character standards are chosen to serve in your FBI. Tonight's file opens in a waterfront saloon as the bartender serves a customer a drink. Here you are, that's four bits. Four bits. What do right. you do with a drunken sailor? What do you do with a drunken sailor? What do you do with a drunken sailor? Early in the morning. <laughs> Fetch me a handful of rye whiskey, Georgie boy. Right. <coughs> well, don't distill the whiskey, son. Just pour it. Coming up. Gentlemen, to the sea. <coughs> first one in the morning always tickles. Another shot, Cap? Uh, first, we better have a few words. Matey, inside this box, I have a camera. A movie camera. I'm sorry, Cap. I can't handle any more stuff. No, oh, but, mate, when I brought you that silk last week... I know, I know. I asked for some cameras. I can't use them now. The guy I was selling I ain't interested. Well, look, all I want for is a drink. Hey, bartender. Huh? Give him a drink. Uh, on you? Yeah, yeah. You mind if I buy one for you, Cap? Oh, uh, do you want the camera? No, no, no. I just hate drinking along. Well, that's my sweetie, to you, boy. Well, thank you, mate. Thank uh, you. I'll take one, too, huh? Okay. I don't want to get the To your kind friends and to the voyage home. Oh. <clears throat> Good whiskey and good friends. What can we do with the drunken sailor? Oh, wait, 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 Cap, wait a minute. How'd you like to have some cup? Sailor? Huh? What can we do with... Hey, what... hey, what's this? Well, hello there. Well, that sounds good. Say, you play that thing, huh? We ought to do fine together. You're not at the bar, you can't. You're going to sing, take your drinks in the back. Okay, come on, Cap. Now, oh, bartender, bring a bottle back to the table, huh? Right. All right, Cap, let's go. Oh, heave ho and up she rises. Heave ho and up she rises. Heave ho and up she rises. Somebody start clearing that far corner. Hey, Gene. We've got a couple of more trucks coming in today. Gene, Gene. Scotty, I told you to stay out of here. Get that big piece broken up, Charlie. Ah, oh, but, Gene, I want to tell Scotty, you something. Scotty, I'm busy. But I got a deal for you. I wouldn't touch a deal of yours if I had a guarantee. Come on, back to work, Joe. This is a junkyard, not a flop house. Hey, Gene, will you stand still and listen for a minute? Look, you remember Whitey Jackson and Louie Adams? 
The other guys heisted all the stuff off the docks last year. And they got knocked off. Yeah, yeah, but nobody ever come up with the stuff Whitey and Louie grabbed. I just found it. Oh, sure. I tell you, I come up with a guy who's got all of it. Who? An old bum I met this morning in a saloon on River Street. He tried to sell a bartender a camera, see? So I bought the bum a drink. He thinks he's a captain on a boat, so I played the harmonica while he sang some songs about sailors. <laughs> Each time he took a belt, I asked him if he had any silk or radios or the other stuff I remembered Whitey and Louie grabbing. He's got them all. Where? That's what we gotta find out. We? Yeah. I bought him a bottle, left him in a joint. He's waiting for us. Well, what do you say? You wanna see him? Well, okay. <laughs> Later that morning at the local FBI field office, Special Agent Taylor returns to his desk to find police detective Doug Mitchell. Oh, Doug, you waiting for me? Yes, Jim. Well, grab a chair. Thanks. I saw your agent in charge, and he said to work with you. Oh, on what? You weren't in the office last year, were you? No, I came from Salt Lake City in January. Well, just about a year ago, two thieves named Whitey Jackson and Louie Adams burglarized shipping piers up and down the river. Mm -hmm. How long did they get away with it? Till we got a description of their boat. Mm -hmm. That night, the harbor patrol spotted them, and they tried to shoot their way out. That's a pretty tough order. Both of them were killed. But when the boat was examined, it was empty. Yeah, maybe they were out looking for a job to do, huh? No, there'd been another burglary an hour before. Well, Doug, could they have gotten back to home base and dropped off the loot? Mm, yes, but from papers in their pockets, we located their drop. Mm. That was empty, too. Why all the uh, sudden activity on the case now, Doug? None of the loot had ever turned up till last night. Oh, Found a couple of pieces when we raided a wholesale dry goods store on the north side. They were from an interstate shipment. Well, that gives us jurisdiction, all right. Yeah. I've interviewed the shopkeeper. He says he bought these particular items from a bartender who works on the waterfront. No name? No, but he did give us a description. Well, Doug, there's quite a few saloons down there. My office is trying to check all of them now, Jim. Oh, fine. If they get a lead, contact me. Right. Cut it Give down a little, Captain. Customers at the bar are beefing. Oh, oh, oh. The customers at the bar are beefing. Hey, what's that? What's that? Customers are beefing. Well, you tell those bar beefing customers that it's Captain Crawford doing these sea shanties. You tell them about me, will you? Tell them about me being the old skipper of the greatest ship ever. Cap, they don't care, and I'll tell you something, neither do I. Oh, is that so? Oh, so you let a man sit here and go around. Well, all right. Go ahead. <laughs> I see somebody coming who does like my singing. Welcome aboard, mateys. I uh, thought he'd be back, Cap. Hey, before you two sit down, keep him quiet or get him out. Yeah, sure, sure. He'll be okay. Uh, Cap, I'd like you to meet a friend of mine. Hiya. Oh, uh, hello, friend. Welcome. Welcome aboard, friend. Sit down. Come on, sit down. Yeah, sure. You still got your mouth organ, matey? Yeah, yeah, but first my friend here wants to talk to you. Oh, about the time we were three days out of Memphis. No, no, know, no, 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 no. When he, the he river wants, was mean. He wants mean. to talk about something else. Captain, I hear you know where I can locate some silk. Oh, who, silk? <laughs> if I wanted to, <laughs> I could show you so much silk, you'd think I was a silkworm. <laughs> You know, in those days in Memphis... Uh, Cap, Cap, please, uh, let's stay with the silk, huh? Yeah, where is it? It's on my ship. You got a ship? What, well, what, what do you mean? What, what, why don't you believe me? No. Well, what do you think of... Say, wait a minute. Now, wait, wait, Cap. Now, hold on. Cap, I've wait got a minute. It. There's only one way to prove it. Well, I'll... Show it to him. I'll prove it. Certainly, I'll show it to him. I'll show him. If somebody will just whoop, it kindly help me so I can get up here with it. Now, I'll have you both piped aboard. What'll it be, men? You George Webster? That's right. I'm a special agent of the FBI here in my credentials. Mm-hmm. This is Detective Mitchell of the police. Hello, Webster. 
Yeah, you're the guy that pinched me two years ago. This is a business call again. Hey, wait a minute. Go look me up. I've been working here since I got out. You can't pin a rap on Nobody's me. Nobody's for... trying to pin anything on you, Webster. Then why'd you come here? Hey, Ask a few questions. Oh, I'll be with you in a minute. Go ahead. I'll answer if I can. It's fine. A man who owns a wholesale dry goods store on the north side has been arrested. We found some of Whitey Jackson and Louie Adams' loot in his back room. Well, what's that got to do with me? He claims you sold it to him. Hey, now, wait a minute. Doug, weren't some uh, home movie cameras stolen by this Jackson and Adams? Three crates of them. Ah. Uh-huh. Webster, may I see that box, please? Which one? On the shelf there, behind the bar. Sure. Here you are. Wait till I get the list of stolen property. All right, Doug. Hey, look, I only work here. Serial number is 09536. 0953. Here it is. That's part of the loot. Well, Webster, that doesn't look very good for you, does it? Hey, how'd I know it was hot? A guy come in and asked me to give him a couple of drinks for the camera. Am I supposed to fingerprint Did everybody? Did you say you got this from a customer? Yeah, an old guy named Cap. Uh-huh. What's the rest of his name? That's all I know. He says he's a captain on a ship. Comes in there a couple of times a week with a camera, a little radio or something else. I give him a few bucks and he drinks it up in here. Hey, give us a beer. In a minute. Can you describe this captain? Yeah. He's about... About six feet tall, gray hair. Usually he got on an old pea jacket and a white cap. You know where he lives? No. But he just left here a little while ago with two guys. And who are they? I don't know. I'm not putting out a description on the captain, All right, Doug. And we'll talk to you, Webster, at headquarters. Scotty, this old bum has taken us no place. Well, he said his boat was at the end of this dock. Hey, Cap! Cap! Ahoy! Yes, matey. Do you know where we're going? Sure thing. That's my ship dead ahead. Does he mean one of them old freighters? I guess so. They're deserted. They've all been tied up here since the war. Come on, mate. Stop the gangplank. What kind of a deal is this? Look, Jane, we followed him this far. I'll guarantee you there's no loot. Well, we can always get out with the freighter. How? Well, one of them would make enough scrap to fill your junk yard. Scotty, you can't heist a freighter. Why not? Nobody around counting them. Hey, come on up, mate. Come on, let's follow him. What can we lose? Well, here's where we wind up getting nailed for trespassing. Well, gents, I'm sorry that none of my crew were here to pipe such distinguished visitors aboard my ship. They all desert you, Cap? No, no, I gave them all shore leave. Then, uh, you're alone here, huh? Yeah, that's right. Come on, let's go in my cabin. Come on, Jim. Let's see what he's got in there. Ladies, come on, boys. Join me inside. This thing will probably sink before we get off it. Gentlemen, after you, after you, ladies. All right, go ahead, Jim. Okay. Now, just make yourself ship shape. Mm-hmm. Hey, Jane, look over there by the wall. Bolts of silk cameras. Yeah. What'd I tell you, huh? Hey, Cap. Yeah. You got any more of that stuff over there around the port? Did you say boat? Young fella, ship. Never say boat. You understand? Ship. Okay, okay. I won't. Look, you got any more of the silk around or those cameras? Oh, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, boy, here's the camera. Filming it, too. Come on, take it. Oh, we want to know if you got more stuff someplace else. Oh, jeez. Lots of it, lots of it. The hole's full up. With silk and cameras? Yeah. Maybe. You got that mouth organ with you? If you have, come on, let's have a tune. As I was Scotty, walking let's down let's get back to the yard and pick up a truck. Okay. Oh, oh, come on, come on, play me some music. A pretty young maid. What we do about him? Oh, that's easy. Oh, oh. That's for the loot. And that's as a music lover. <laughs> Local newspapers through America, beginning next Sunday, there will appear an advertisement of the Equitable Life Assurance Society, which carries a special message on inflation. It is signed by Thomas I. Parkinson, 
president of the Equitable Life Assurance Society. This message is both timely and important. You'll undoubtedly want to read it in full next week. In the meantime, here are the most significant passages. The total insurance in force with the Equitable Society represents money held for future delivery. When due, every dollar of that sum will be paid. But as a responsible institution of thrift, with more than six million people who look to us for economic security, we are concerned with the purchasing power of those dollars when they become due. For mounting inflation, man-made threatens not only the worth of the dollar, but the very existence of our national enterprise. Indeed, this threat is as real and deadly as the red menace against which we are arming. But the plain fact is that in the fight against inflation, we as a nation are hiding under the bed. When we freeze wages or prices, we are merely doctoring the symptoms of the inflation disease rather than the disease itself. If we are to stop the inflationary trend, the makers of our public policies must deal with the monetary causes of the inflation. They must control the expansion of bank deposits and the constantly increasing money supply. There's nothing mysterious about this inflation. More and more, people are beginning to realize that the stories they read on the financial pages of their newspapers have a direct relationship to the prices of food, furniture, and other living essentials advertised in the same newspapers a week later. Inflation is everybody's concern, from the Wall Street banker to the Missouri housewife. In the fight against it, the American people, you and your neighbors, must learn to look beyond the local grocer's bill and the meat prices in the butcher shop. You must look to Washington, the seat of our government, where the monetary policy is made. More than that, you must make your own voice heard among the lawmakers. Congress should be interested in your views on inflation, and your congressman is as close as your nearest mailbox or telegraph office. Let me repeat, if we are to stop this inflationary trend, the makers of our public policies must deal with the monetary causes of the inflation. They must control the expansion of bank deposits and the constantly increasing money supply. And now back to the FBI file, Captain Larceny. The opportunity to commit crime in one form or another is actually part of the daily lives of every one of us. Indeed, criminals are distinguished from good citizens not by any greater opportunity for crime, but mainly by the criminal's failure to resist temptation. Admittedly, resisting is sometimes difficult, as it must have been in the case of the sea captain in tonight's story. Yet, had he done what he should have, had he notified the police when he found the loot on the freighter, he would have saved himself from physical assault. It is no excuse that he took only a little of the loot he came across. For it isn't possible to draw a line and say, I will steal this much and no more. For if tonight's case teaches any single lesson, it is this. Crime prevention begins at the tips of our own fingers. And crime prevention is not only a moral matter, but also a matter of self-preservation. Tonight's file continues at police headquarters where Special Agent Taylor is interviewing the suspected bartender. Webster, how about going over those pictures again? Ah, it's no use. You gave us a description on the captain, so I'm inclined to believe that he's an actual person. He is. But those other two men, you can't find their pictures. You can't tell us their names, and you don't even remember what they look like. It's true. I've seen them around, but I... Oh, hello, Doug. Anything in on that alarm? Oh, not a word. How you doing here? Well, he either can't or won't give us any more help. I'm inclined to think... Wait a minute. I don't know whether this will help or not, but about a week ago, Cap came in and showed me a tattoo on his arm. No? It was a picture of a ship. He have any special reason for showing it to you? Yeah. He said it was new. Did he say where he had it done? Someplace on Main Street. Well, that might give us a lead. Come on, Doug. Let's cover every tattoo parlor down there. Got all 
all day, Scotty. Yeah, but this stuff is heavy. Throw it on. Let's get this truck out of here. Now, that's the load. Grab that other door. Okay. Come on. Oh, wait, wait. I'll be right back. Where are you going? Well, my harmonica. It's still in the captain's cabin. Leave it there. That thing cost me 40 clams. All right. Do what you want. I'm going. All right. Forget it. Get in on this side. All right. How much you think we got? Both loads. About 10 G's worth. <laughs> What's funny? You not making any deal with me. Huh? That's why you'll always be a minor leaguer, Scotty. W what are you talking about? If you held out before we got to the boat, you could have made me give you half the profit. This way, you get 20%. Oh, wait a minute, Gene. That ain't Don't right. Don't argue I... about it. I'll cut it down. Oh, Gene, the whole thing was my idea. What... Now stop beefing or I'll charge you for the ride. Come in on the captain, Doug? Not yet, Jim. We may find him anyway. I had some luck. Hmm? Captain went to a tattoo parlor at Maine and Broadway. He told the operator there his name was Crawford. Hmm. And part of the tattoo was the name of his ship, the SS Peter Simon. Oh. You check the ship's registry? Yeah, the SS Peter Simon's a freighter that's been mothballed since 1946. Hmm? And nobody named Crawford was ever the captain on it. Where's the boat now? The uh, registry's checking that. I questioned Webster again when I got back. No? You remember anything else? Not much. One of the men who left with the captain played a harmonica. Oh? Oh, uh, pardon me, Jim. Sure. Take the Mitchell. Yes, yes, that's right. It is? Oh, fine, fine. Thanks for calling. The SS Peter Simon's tied up at Cliff Point. I'll ask the 20th Precinct to send a couple of men over to the pier. Fine. Let's get up there ourselves. <laughs> Find anything, Jim? Yeah, Doug. If this ship was used to store all the loot, somebody's made off with most of it. The men from the 20th are going over the pier for us. Oh, good. Hey, look. Huh. Scroll on that door there. Please knock before entering Captain P.J. Crawford. Stand back, Doug. Nobody home. There's a harmonica on the table there. Yeah. You know, Webster might have been telling the truth at that. Maybe we can get some prints off it. Hey, look there. Yeah, what? It's staying here on the floor. Looks like blood. Still wet. There's another one over there. Where? By the closet door. I'll get it. Oh. Hey, let's get him out on the couch. Come on. Yeah, grab his leg. All right. Hey. Oh. oh. Bad scalp. Yeah. Easy laying him down now. All right, here we are. Examine him, will you, Doug? Okay. I'll get out of the car and radio for an ambulance. Dr. Chanchimino. Dr. Chanchimino, call the front desk, There's please. There's the captain's bed, Doug. Oh. <laughs> Hello, Captain. Oh, hello, matey. I'm a special agent of the FBI. This is Detective Mitchell. Oh, welcome, welcome aboard. You know uh, why we're here? Yeah, I admit it. Terrible thing, stealing cargo from your own vessel. You sold to anyone but George Webster, Captain? Uh, I don't know, George somebody, bartender. How much did you give him? Well, uh, I never kept the figures in my log. Well, about how much? Oh, 20, maybe $25 worth. That all? Yeah. Did you know a Whitey Jackson and Louis Adams? No. Well, how about that pair you met in the saloon? Suppose you tell us about them. Well, they're crooks. I never should have taken them on board my ship. Can you give us their names, Captain? Names? No. Let me see now. There's a tall one. He's, uh, he's, uh, Gene. Gene. Gene what? Oh, no, I'm afraid that's all I know. Well, how about the other one? Well, the short one. Now, let me see. His name, let me see. It'll come. 
Scotty. Scotty, that's it, that's it, Scotty. Uh Uh-huh. What did they look like? Well, I guess I was pretty drunk here when I met the tall. I don't remember much what he looked like. Well, can you give us a description of this Scotty? Yeah, let me see now. Scotty, he was kind of dark, wears a little mustache, dressed real seedy. Any scars or marks on him? Scars? Yes, yeah, he had a little one on his chin. Captain, do you think you'd recognize their pictures? Don't know that I would. Now, if I was to hear that short one just play that mouth organ, then I'd be sure. Scotty is the harmonica player? Oh, plays it sweet, too. Mm. Well, thank you, Captain. Come on, Doug. Where to? Let's find a phone. Don't pile that stuff there, Charlie. Hello, oh, Jim. Hi, Scotty. Put that under the shed. I waited for you last night. I got tied up here at the yard. You uh, hear me? You got my dough? Come on in the shack. You really hate to pay. You know anybody who likes it? Go ahead. Now, hold out your mitt. hundred, two hundred, two fifty, three. Was the rest? That's it. You said 20%. I changed my mind. It's like any business, Scotty. Sometimes the price goes down overnight. Gene, are you on the market for some pictures? Pictures? Yeah. That little camera the captain had on the boat works real good. Here, take a look. Nice one of you coming out of the hole with the silk, huh? What else you got? Well, first we make a price on this one. I figure... Say a G. I also got some good poses of you loading stuff on the truck. Now, I ain't saying... You ain't saying nothing. Go ahead. Go ahead, tear them. The negatives are in the envelope. My landlady's got it. Huh? If I ain't home in an hour, she takes it to the cops. How much for the set, G? Suppose we set the price. Huh? Who are you? Special agent of the FBI. Keep him covered, Doug. Right. Now, let's take them in. Gene Fulton and Larry Scott were turned over to state authorities and prosecuted for assault with intent to kill. Each received a 10-year sentence. When Special Agent Taylor learned the man called Scotty was the one who played the harmonica and that he dressed in seedy clothes, it seemed reasonable that anyone owning an expensive instrument might pawn it when he found himself short. A series of phone calls to the city's pawn shops revealed a man answering Scotty's description was a regular customer. The pawn shop supplied his address, and at the rooming house, Agent Taylor and Detective Mitchell learned from his landlady where Scotty had gone. Almost all the stolen property was thus recovered, and later returned to the rightful owners, returned as a kind of dividend of law enforcement. It is true that vigorous police investigation always pays dividends to the people, But one thing is even more profitable, crime prevention. Practice it and see. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry D. Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. Others in the cast were Jim Backus, Anthony Barrett, Ed Begley, Walter Catlett, and John Mitchell. This Is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community, and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling transcribed story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Hollywood Shakedown on This Is Your FBI. Stay tuned for the adventures of Ozzy and Harriet. There's fun for the whole family when Ozzy and Harriet come your way next. This program came to you from Hollywood. <laughs>